Permit, check. Ticket, check. Winter jackets, check. And Facebook status is up. She's all packed and the countdown begins. In less than 24 hours, Vanaja Siva will board a plane for Sweden, where she will spend the next five years pursuing her PhD at the Chalmers University of Technology, Gothenburg. Vanaja is probably the happiest woman on the planet today. Her only wish is to be surrounded by close family and friends who are bidding her farewell as she boards the plane tonight. But her actual journey began seven years ago when three men and one woman were chosen from 11,275 applicants by the Malaysian National Space Agency, or ANCASA, to spend two weeks in Star City outside Moscow, Russia. They were a part of the ANCASA-1 spaceflight training program, and Vanaja Siva was the only woman on the team. The project was conceived in 2003 when Russia agreed to send a Malaysian to the International Space Station as part of a billion dollar purchase of 18 Sukhoi 30 MKM fighter jets. Out of the four candidates, two were shortlisted upon their return from cosmonaut training. Empat terpilih adalah Dr. Sheikh Mustafa Shuko, Sheikh Mustafa, Vanaja Siva, Dr. Faiz Khalid dan Muhammad Faiz Kamaludin. Mac 2006, keempat-empat calon menjalani pemeriksaan perubatan di Rusia. 4 September 2006, Perdana Menteri Datuk Seri Abdullah Ahmad Badawi mengumumkan Dr. Syed Muzaffar dan Dr. Faiz adalah dua calon angkasawan. Eventually, an orthopedic surgeon, Sheikh Muzaffar Shakur, was picked as the Malaysian cosmonaut researcher to crew the Russian Soyuz TMA-11 mission on October 10, 2007. In many interviews, Vanaja has admitted that participating in the program was the best thing to have happened to her. But despite being on the threshold of the greatest experience of her life, her dream was shattered when she did not make the cut for the final two. Later in the year, Vanaja received the MISAT scholarship and left to pursue a master's degree at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden, which she completed in 2009. She is, she is returning today to complete her PhD. Malaysia Kinney recently had the opportunity to talk to this wonderful woman, walking with her down memory lane as she recounted the cherished memories of her days in the space program. But I have never, and even in my wildest dream, thought of becoming an astronaut. It never crossed my mind. It, it was the most amazing uh, feeling I could ever get because <clears throat> uh, it wasn't easy. Definitely, it wasn't easy, and I had to struggle a lot with myself when I came to the final four with the medical test because ninety percent of the stages, the selection process was medical test. So I've been tested from head to toe medically, and um, <clears throat> that was the area that I can't control, that I couldn't control at that time. So whatever result comes back, I have to take it. Any of those results could have come back as negative, but it didn't. Human centrifuge, yeah. Ah, yeah. So, <laughs> it doesn't. How was that experience? Oh, it was the most horrific experience I've had <laughs> in my entire life, not just the process. Um, <clears throat> we already did the centrifuge here, mm -hmm. so that was when there were final twenty-seven of us. So that was the first time they put us in the centrifuge here. Uh, centrifuge induces uh, G-force. Uh, it's like a huge. Um, machine, you know, which spins on an XL like this, and you're sitting inside here. And this thing spins as well, while this is spinning. So that's the best I can <laughs> show you on how it works. Uh, Air Force pilots, they pass this test all the time because they've already been for this test before they can become an Air Force pilot. I had renowned respect for Air Force pilots after I've been through <laughs> the centrifuge. And um, <clears throat> the Normal human being can only stand up to 4 Gs, the pressure of 4 Gs, before passing out. So the first test that we did in the centrifuge was 5 Gs. Uh, out of 27 of us, there were at least 3 or 4 Air Force pilots there, so they passed the test. And the rest of us, all of us passed out. <clears throat> so the minute you pass out, you let go of the lever that you're holding, the machine stops. It'll come to a stop. So the passing out part is the best part, you know. You're just sitting there and it the... The, your vision gets darkened from this side. You feel like something is blocking your vision. It's becoming black and black and black. Yeah, exactly. That's the first time I was experiencing it. It was so cool. <laughs> <laughs>
and the minute you pass out, you, your head just drops, and when the liver goes down, the machine stops, right? The minute the G-force comes down, you get up like that. You're completely awake. And then some guys had a dream about his mother during that <laughs> two seconds of passing out. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. <laughs> and when you get up, you're like nauseated, and you feel like throwing up, and your head is throbbing, and it's spinning, and you know, you, you can't even carry your head on your body. It's, it's that bad. It's horrific. The feeling is horrific. So that was my first experience and I knew I passed out. I didn't make it to 45 seconds. So I, <clears throat> I stood inside there and the, the major from outside, he said, uh, okay, you didn't, you didn't finish the test. Do you want to come out, get some rest and then go back inside again or do you want to continue? And I told him, I am not getting out of this thing until I finish it. And I am never getting inside this thing ever again. So we do it again now. <laughs> so I did it. <clears throat> I strained every muscle in my body and I did it for 45 seconds. The and I passed it. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the second round. I was still inside there. And I passed the test and came out. <laughs> oh my God, that was worse. And after that, they made us see through 6 Gs, 8 Gs and 9 Gs. I went up to 9 Gs. For 9 Gs, we had to sit through it for uh, 18 seconds. 18 seconds. When I finished the 9 G test and I came out, I had a sprained ankle because I was straining myself that much to get through the 18 seconds. It's called parabolic flight. And the final two guys went through that. We didn't because it's extremely expensive to do that test. So. Um, they just do the test to make sure that you experience zero gravity. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a test, it's part of the training. So only those two guys went for that. I didn't get a chance to do that, so which is a shame. So they have this flight which just goes up all the way and then it drops. They do that for six times. So each time it drops, you actually experience zero gravity for like five seconds. Mm -hmm. So you're floating for a while and then you drop. And then they pick up again and then they come down again and then you experience it for like five seconds and then you drop. I hear that some people get nauseated and stuff like that. It depends on your body, of course. So I didn't do that test. I'll let Sheikh tell you that story. Oh, oh the Russians. The Russians, they are the first one to conquer outer space. They've been doing this since 1960. So <clears throat> they have the best facil facilities. And um, even the Americans go in the Russian uh, Soyuz to outer space most of the time. Because the Russians are still using the rocket. It's, very, it's a very old method, but then it works. That's what the Russians will always tell you when you ask them. You look around and you see everything is so old. And you tell them, oh, how old is that machine? And they will look at you and they'll say, it's old, but it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> they still use the rocket. And, but the Americans, they're using space shuttles, so, which is like an aeroplane. It takes off and it lands. But the Russians are still using rocket. And there are a lot of other tourists, space tourists, even the American astronauts, who goes in the rocket to the outer space. 20 million US dollars. I think you're talking about Anusha Ansari. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've met her. Very nice woman. Yeah. Yeah. We were, we were in Russia together. Yeah. She's an amazing, inspiring woman. She has so much of passion for this field. Yeah. Every year, there's at least one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the Russian uh, so used the rocket, it can only uh, carry three astronauts at one time. Mm -hmm. So there must be a commander, that's one. So it's usually Russian or American. Mm -hmm. And then you must have an a engineer that you take up to do work in the ISS or any of those things. So it can be anyone. And the third seat, the Russians are always selling it to someone who pays them money. So which is a, is a good thing and also a bad thing because the Russian astronauts feel that it's taking away their chance of going to space. But then they also make the money, of course. So that's why it's US $20 million. And anybody who can afford it could take up that space. And I think, I think the, the seat is taken for the next 10 years, I think. Every time I talk about it, the, you know, the passion and the feeling comes back, you know, and I feel like, oh my god, I haven't forgotten anything. Everything is still there in my mind. And it's amazing talking about it, if it's going to help even one little girl. I will talk about it again and again. Uh, it's, it's still nice. It's still a dream. For me, it's, I, I went after a dream. 
and it didn't happen, so it remains a dream. I only strike off a dream after I've achieved it. So this is a dream I haven't achieved, so it's still in my list. Tonight, as she flies yet again across the Indian Ocean to pursue another dream, we hope Malaysians remember Vanaja and are inspired by her story. Anything is possible with hard work and dedication, as long as we never, ever give up.